screen. And while that's happening, uh, so Mike's talk is going to be about determining optimal um, interventions, or as his title now shows, it's like how do we define an appropriate objective function for infectious disease outbreaks? And uh, thanks very much, Ed. Yep, yeah, I can hear you fine, Mike. So can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Please yeah, take it so away. Thank you. I will take it away. Thank you. Yeah, so the first thing I should say is I am. Um, I, I need to give my Apologies right at the start. Unfortunately, at three o'clock, I have to go and teach. So I'm afraid I will be away for an hour. Um, I have to go and teach life sciences students about the ethics of doing experiments on mice. So um, I would much rather be in this session. But if there are any follow up discussions, I'd be really interested to partake in those. So um, what I want to talk about today is um, some of the work that really um, Ed and I have been working on a lot. And also I've discussed with Flavio, too. And I'm very interested in taking this forward, which is thinking about objective functions for disease control um, so and i'm just i'm going to really sort of set up the problem some of this is going to be things that we would have seen before um, so really it's based about the idea of in the event of an outbreak of infectious disease policymakers usually just want to know what they should do now what we've tend to do as epidemiologists is look at this retrospectively and go back and look at data and say what should we have done but in reality, we've been doing a lot of this in real time, and therefore it's really important for us to think about what should we do and move from the idea of retrospective analysis into predictions. So, and I want to give a sort of an example of this in um, the idea of, well, you know, if you think about, say, going out, right, so going out and you need to make a decision as to what wet weather gear should you take if you're going to go out for the day. Well, of course, it depends. Um, and in that situation, it depends. Well, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on the chance of rain. So we take a we take a risk and we assess risk based upon the chance of rain at any period of time. And based upon that risk, we can decide whether we take an umbrella or whether we don't take anything. But of course, there's also the chance of strong wind. And that might influence what we decide to do because we don't necessarily want our umbrella to blow away. So here we have a really simple kind of decision space where based upon these different metrics we can decide what to do and we can then sort of assess our risk based upon as i say if i just go through this again the risk of all of these different scenarios um so in this simple example we may think that the only objective of course is not to get wet but in reality there's uncertainty whether it's going to rain and will we get cold? Will we have to carry an umbrella if it doesn't rain or a raincoat? And so we have an objective function here that we are influences our decision and we may try to minimize across all of these potential impacts. So again, I mean, it's a really almost flippant example, but it leads us into thinking about infectious disease outbreaks. So I'm going to actually start before we move on to talk about COVID, I'm going to start um, doing some, um, just giving an example of some work related to this that we did on livestock disease. So um, a few years ago, we looked at trying to determine what would be an optimal policy for a livestock disease outbreak, where maybe we have a few candidate control options. I do apologise, for some reason, my slides are on timing, which is why they keep flipping ahead. Um, so we maybe have um, an idea of, well, how many infected farms do we have? How many doses of vaccination do we have? And we might have three different strategies that we could do. And dependent upon those strategies, we can determine whether we cull, whether we vaccinate, um, and you know, what the radius of those different things might be. So we can determine what an optimal policy is dependent upon those metrics. So what we did with this piece of work is we ran kind of a reinforcement learning algorithm across this, where we looked at several different control actions that we could do, several different culling actions, several different vaccination actions for an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. And what you can come up with is based upon how big your outbreak is in terms of number of cases on the y-axis, in terms of the spatial scale of your outbreak on the x-axis, you can determine what the optimal policy is. Now, in this particular scenario, my objective function is minimizing outbreak duration. Now, if I'm minimizing outbreak duration, this can tell me for that particular scenario, my optimal policy is to wrinkle out to 3.5 kilometers, for example, if that is the current state of the outbreak. If I'm here, then my optimal action is to vaccinate out to three kilometers. But of course, that's based upon minimizing outbreak duration. 
If actually I want to minimize the total number of livestock culled, then we can see that actually my optimal decision is dominated by vaccination. You can see on the bottom, lots of greens, which are vaccination actions. On the top, if I'm minimizing outbreak duration, lots of reds in there and yellows, which is culling. So again, it's a really simple way to say, dependent upon your objective, you get a different optimal policy. Um, now, what we can do, of course, with reinforcement learning is we can compare multiple objectives. So we can have kind of these different decision spaces based upon outbreak duration and livestock cold. And we could sort of map them across each other and we could determine whether there are regions where there are kind of win-win scenarios. So regardless of your objective, you can get the same policy being optimal, as you can see here on the bottom. And there might be some regions where actually your objective determines what your optimal policy is. There may be some discordance. Um, OK, so that's a simple example of what mouth disease. And now I'm going to just give a, a similar example of some work that we have done recently for COVID-19. And apologies to Flavio and others because they've seen this work before, but this really um, sort of sets kind of the problem up that I'd quite like to get some feedback on. So back in kind of September 2020, um, SPIM were looking at in the UK, who are the sort of modelling group who advised the UK government on COVID decision making, were looking at whether we should introduce a circuit breaker lockdown to control the rise in cases. Now, the idea behind the circuit breaker was you put it in place for a short period of time, it's planned. And if it is planned, theoretically, and I hasten to add this is theoretically, it doesn't have as severe an impact on the economy as kind of um, control policies that are brought in um, with little warning. But of course, it doesn't fix everything. And that's the key thing here. So as I said, we began to investigate this in September 2020. And the idea behind this is, you know, you've got an exponentially growing curve here. If you put in a circuit breaker that can reduce the R number below one, then theoretically it should turn things down. But of course, when you release the circuit breaker, cases move up again. Um, and here you can see this is kind of an example of um, our um, relative growth rates, well, our, our uh, decay rates, as it were, when the circuit breaker comes in, as given by the blue, green, purple, and yellow lines here. So the more severe the circuit breaker, unsurprisingly, um, the bigger impact it will have in terms of reducing hospitalizations per day. But then when you release it, it goes back up again. And the key point here is the effectiveness of the circuit breaker is dependent upon the objective again. So much of the work we have done really thinks about the direct impact of an intervention upon cases, upon hospital admissions and upon deaths. But of course, we know that interventions are also harmful. There are other losses associated with those. So what we did, and I say this is very much a proof of concept and needs a lot more development, but really what we were trying to do is put something in place to sort of tease out how the optimal policy may change if we thought about cost is we started off looking at monthly GDP. So we used our intervention intensity parameter phi as a measure of how much control there was in the system. And then we basically fitted a polynomial with that phi to monthly GDP through time in 2020. So essentially, dependent upon how severe the lockdown was, that could give us some measure of what the, what the GDP was. Um, now, you'll notice with this uh, model, we have two lines here. We have a blue line and a red line. And the idea here was that we assumed that there was an early shock to GDP as a, as a result of the first lockdown. Um, and if we were trying to project this forward, it may be that any future lockdown would not have the same kind of impact. So we had two different models, one where we fitted to the whole of 2020 and one where we fitted after the first lockdown in the UK from June onwards, hence the two different uh, lines here. And then what we looked at was, could we determine what an optimal policy would be based upon a given willingness to pay per quality adjusted life year avoided? So effectively, what we're trying to do is minimize the willingness to pay times our quality loss plus the loss to GDP. And that gives us a sort of a, a starting point of a measure of overall cost, but very much a starting point. 
And then what we can do is we can run a whole different set of kind of assumptions around circuit breaker lockdowns. So we can have a baseline level of control, which is given by the X axis here. And then we can assume that based upon each baseline level of control, we then put circuit breakers of various different intensity in place. Now, this is a very complicated set of figures. So just to explain this, the dark circle at the top of each one of these lines corresponds to a constant level of control outside a circuit breaker. And then the smaller paler dots that you see underneath them correspond to different timings and intensities of circuit breakers. And it's those that we are trying to optimize what time should you introduce your circuit breaker and how severe should it be in terms of minimizing this overall cost and the red and the blue circles here so the left hand ones with the red ones are fitting to all of 2020 and the right hand ones are fitting from june onwards show the optimal policy that minimizes the overall monetary loss and on the bottom you can see is our model predictions of hospital emissions and deaths with the circuit breakers kind of given as bars on the top there, the black bars on the top say, this is where the model says the optimal timings of those circuit breakers should be. Now, this first set of graphs I'm showing assumes a willingness to pay of 30,000 pounds per quality, which is roughly kind of what, you know, we would use sort of from as a health economics perspective in terms of, you know, the, the whether it's worth kind of sending a, uh, a pharmaceutical drug to market, for example. However, if we are willing to spend more money per quality loss avoided, then you can see that your optimal policy slightly changes. It shifts things a little bit towards um, slightly more intensive control policies because we are willing to spend more money in order to reduce the health impact of the disease. OK, so for a given value of willingness to pay, we can establish the optimal timing and intensity of these lockdowns. Um, and this just shows you kind of to sum all this up a little bit more simply. So as you go from the top to the bottom here, this is a different value of willingness to pay from £20,000 per quality loss avoided all the way up to £200,000 per quality loss avoided. Um, and the background shading here in these graphs show the intensity of the control policy both within and outside the lockdown periods. And it's totally unsurprising as you go from top to bottom, you can see that things get darker in the background. So the more money you're willing to spend, then of course you're going to recommend more serious control policies. Um, so yes, perhaps an unsurprising result, but you can determine what an optimal timing is based upon this exact willingness to pay. So um, just a couple more um, slides I wanna show, and then I'm gonna leave it maybe for a, for a little bit of discussion. The other thing that we looked at was we then fast forward this for fast forwarded this work to early 2021 when the vaccination campaign started to be rolled out in the UK. And we said, well, actually, at the start of 2021, um, we had a and again, we went into another lockdown in 2021. Um, and I apologize, this is an old slide. So I now have current lockdown, which is now out of date. It's no longer a current lockdown in the UK. Current lockdown as of 2021. Um, and what we looked at was, could we determine what the optimal speed to release lockdown would be given a particular willingness to pay? Um, now, in this situation, we were vaccines had just been rolled out. There was uncertainty regarding how rapidly we could vaccinate. So we looked at, at the time either two million doses per week or four million doses per week could be rolled out. Um, and then the gray shading again here shows you the sort of the relative intensity of the lockdown period. So the lower it gets over time, this sort of corresponds to lockdown being released. Um, and again, if your willingness to pay is high at the bottom, then you're going to recommend a gradual relaxation of lockdown. If you are willing to spend less money, then of course you release things faster, but the result of that is you get a much bigger resurgence in terms of number of cases. Um, so again, this kind of really shows quite simply that dependent upon our objective, we will recommend a very different optimal policy. OK, so just to kind of summarize, I mean, we've this really is very much a, a proof of principle, but we have shown again that the optimal policy here is highly dependent upon willingness to pay. We have only used GDP as a measure for economic impact. And I've discussed this with 
uh, Flavio and others already, but we are aware that really um, there are other measures that we will need to incorporate in the longer term to properly establish economic harm. And of course, there are other health harms that we've not included in this metric. We are only considering health, we are not directly considering the health impacts of lockdown, only the impacts of COVID are included in our quality calculations. So this is other things we need to include. Um, so I think there is potential here. Um, and I just want to kind of show, just to go back, just to finish with to the reinforcement learning work that I showed, I ran a kind of a simple toy model just to kind of show a little bit of a reinforcement learning algorithm for release of the 2021 lockdown. Um, just to show you what we could do in terms of optimizing a control policy. And this is very much a toy, but um, if we purely try to optimize based upon health, um, then what we can do is we can determine what an optimal policy would be to come out of the 2021 lockdown. And if I just run this, this is just a simple learning algorithm. And as you go from red to gray here, this is kind of very severe to less severe control. You can see, again, unsurprisingly, the model recommends you keep severe lockdown in for a long period of time and you don't get a big resurgence um, as a result of that. However, if I put more weight on the, the economy, um, then I can run this again. Um, and you can see that the model now shifts everything over to the to the y axis. Um, it's, try, it's basically learning where it thinks is the optimal policy should be. And it recommends releasing control much more rapidly than that. But of course, as a result of that, you get a resurgence in cases. So again, there is this trade off dependent upon what your objective is. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. But, you know, just really a couple of questions. You know, we have defined a couple of objective functions that are by no means the correct objective functions for any infectious disease outbreak, but really it's just to motivate discussion. So how do we define an objective function for an infectious disease outbreak? And the other point, which I think is, is something that we should all reflect on, how do we effectively communicate that? It's something that we have all probably found very difficult throughout the pandemic, that we've, been, that we've dealt with people who think, you know, we should stay in lockdown forever or we should drop lockdown and all go back to normal immediately. And of course, the truth is somewhere in between that. But it's dependent upon the objective. And it's something that I think we have had a real challenge to communicate for the last two years in the media. But it's also extremely important. So I think with that thought, I'll leave it there. And I'm quite, quite happy to have questions or some discussion about this. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, thank you, Maha.